from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And he's going to present about uh, modeling of the immune system. And thereby, he will uh, show how to combine a variety of different modeling paradigm, including constraint-based models, uh, agent-based models, and also differential equations, um, also in implying a Monte Carlo method. So I'm very curious to see this. Um, hello. So today I will talk about my multi-scale model of, this, of CD4 plus T cells. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, as well as our universities, the rest of the Helica Lab. I want to thank NIH because they fund my work, and of course, CISMOD for a travel fellowship. This is the immune system and its function is to defend the body against disease causing invaders. And as you can see, see, it is a whole body system and it infiltrates many tissues and organs. And it is under tight and fine control because if it is too weak, it cannot fight the in, in, um, infections. So an example is AIDS caused by HIV. But if it is too strong, it will end up attacking yourself, and that's autoimmunity. And to achieve such a fine level of control, the mechanism spans many scales of organization. The immune system can be seen as a network of cells and molecules. And what we are trying to do is to mathematically and computationally capture the information flow in this network. So what do I mean by many scales? On the population level, it is heterogeneous. There are different cell types, and each type has many phenotypes and metabolic states. Outside the cells, they, they reside in a soup of cytokines, so the dynamics matter. Same goes for antibodies. Moving inside each cell, there are signaling, gene regulation, and metabolic networks. And what we're focusing on is the system level dynamics between different scales and not any particular scales. And we're using CD4 plus T lymphocytes as our example. So what are they? They're central to the adaptive branch of the immune system so it is antigen specific. It takes a few days to develop after an infection. But once it's there, it is long lasting, sometimes for life. And they don't fight infections directly. Instead, they secrete cytokines in order to help other cell types to fight the infections. And as you can see in this diagram, it has many phenotypes and these are the four major ones. So they differentiate into different phenotypes for different purposes. So multi-talented, just like myself. And this diagram shows the typical life cycle of a CD4 plus T cell. They start as, an, as naive cells, and when there's an infection, they activate. As effector cells, they divide rapidly and produce cytokines to do the job. And after the infection, the majority of the cells just die, but the survivors become memory cells which respond much faster. So this diagram shows that um, the activation mechanism of T cell is complex. So moving on to the model, this schematic shows the spatial layout of the, of the system. We're chopping the body into three compartments. The first one is the target organ, where the infection occurs. It's linked to a draining lymph node, and 
the final, uh, the final one is a circulation system that's like the rest of the body. And um, yeah. each compartment contains a solution of 11 cytokines, and they are relevant to CD4 plus T cells. And we're modeling the concentrations as spatially lumped variables, meaning they depend on time only. In a sense, the system is like three continuous stirred reactors, and the lymph node and circulation are like, are like downstream units configured in parallel, and there's a recycle stream. Um, so on the cell population level, we have CD4 plus T cells, which have different phenotypes, and they can move between the compartments in different migration patterns depending on the circumstances. They sense and produce cytokines. And computationally, we are treating each cell as an autonomous and discrete agent. So the method is agent-based model, modeling. And the invading antigen and the rest of the immune system, they're abstracted in the user-defined user signal, and that's the input. Moving on to the mathematics, the cytokine dynamics, the concentrations are modeled by a set of ODEs. Uh, the master equation is here. So for each cytokine, there are three such equations because they're three compartments. And they're coupled through the transport terms. But you will notice that the production and consumption terms are linear, meaning the dynamics of species A do not affect species B. On the right, you have a schematic summarizing the information flow in the system. And central to it is the agent-based model. It is parameterized by the, OD, uh, by the concentrations from the ODEs and the user-defined signal. And it passes, to, passes the information to each agent, inside which there's a logical model and five metabolic models. And once they're solved, the outputs are passed back to the agent-based model, and that will parameterize the ODEs. Now we move inside each CD4 plus T cell. First, we consider signaling and gene regulation, and we, we are using log a logical model to describe that. And it is an expanded version of a model built by my esteemed colleague, Banwa, who is there. And we're using Cell Collective, a powerful software, web-based, and uh, to build and analyze the network. So what is a logical model? It means that each node in the diagram is a Boolean variable, zero or one. And the yellow ones are inputs that are stochastically on, not off. The gray ones are the outputs, and they're determined by the states of the other nodes. So in short, it is a Markov chain, meaning each update is dependent on the collective state of the model at this moment. And the activity level of each node is the fraction of iterations where it is on. So like I said, the yellow ones are the inputs. There are three classes. You have the user-defined input. Roughly, that's the viral load and you have the cytokine concentrations from the ODEs, and you have the internal state of the cell, such as how old it is. And the first class of outputs are the transcription factors, and they represent the four major phenotypes of CD4 plus T cells, and um, those probabilities are passed back to the agent-based model as attributes so that we know we can use that to assign a phenotype to the agent. The second class, uh, then like internal state of the cell, like such as how likely the cell will die or form memory, and those are again agent attributes. And um, the third class are cytokines produced by the cell, and they determine the cytokines it can produce at the ODE, at, at the agent level. And the agent-based shell will summarize the information about all the agents, 
and collectively parameterize the ODEs. And this final group is the interesting one. They represent metabolic events such as lipid synthesis or glucose uptake. And they're abstract in the sense that each node represents many reaction fluxes, such as aerobic glycolysis. Is contr uh, it controls many metabolic fluxes. They become agent attributes and are passed to the five metabolic modules. So in the metabolic model, we have five metabolic modules because we have four major phenotypes plus the naive cell. And um, my colleague, Banwa, built the models and we are preparing the manuscript. The technique we're using is called flux balance analysis and a quick tutorial. First, you look at experimental data to come up with a reaction map about the metabolism in the cell. And then you do a mass balance on each metabolite so you'll have a set of ODEs. If you assume steady state, the ODEs become a set of algebraic equations. And the equations have metabolic fluxes as variables. If you combine them in an intelligence way, you can define an objective function. In our case, there's biomass or DNA production. And you can set constraints on the metabolic fluxes, the variables, and that comes from the logical model outputs. And then we can use linear programming to optimize the objective function in order to get the production rates. So you are going to ask me, how are we going to use the optimized values? And the answer is, as Matteo was saying, cell cycle. We're using the, pro the production rates to track each agent's progress through, through each stage of the cell cycle. And by extension, we can decide when it divides, a key part of co population dynamics. So before I conclude, I'll show some validation studies. The first part has to do with population dynamics in response to influenza. So in this experimental study, um, these researchers, they isolated some CD4 plus T cells and then labeled them and transferred them to the mice. And the mice were inoculated with influenza A. So at different time points following inoculation, um, the mice were killed and samples and they just counted the number of cells and measured the viral load. So we took uh, the viral trajectory as our model input. And then we put it in the model and ran some simulations. So we compared our outputs with the experiment. At four days post-infection, according to the experiment, um, the cell expansion is 16-fold. So in my simulation, expansion in the lymph node is observed, but not as much, and I'll explain that later. And in the experiment, there shouldn't be any effective cells in the lungs. And this, in my, in my simulation, there are some, some effective cells, but they're at a very low level, very far from the peak. So the essence, which is time delay, has been reproduced. There's qualitative agreement. So you, about the quantitative differences, and that's because we are not modeling the antigen and the rest of the immune system directly. We are using an abstract, non-physical input. And in any case, if you want to fit the data to a T, you can always fine-tune the parameters. At six days post-infection, according to the experiment, the response peaked, uh, peaked in all the samples, and I validated it perfectly. And then eight days post post-infection, according to the experiment, the populations were de declining. And once again, I managed to reproduce that dynamic. And in the second validation study, I considered differentiation. So in this recent study, an elegant one, the researchers, they took out naive cells and they cultured them with, T uh, with receptor signals and supplemented the cultures with cytokines. There are 64 combinations of six cytokines. 
So they're binary in the sense that, for example, IL-2 is either present at a particular concentration or not on. And then they just measure the expression levels of the four transcription factors and other cytokines and use that to classify the cells into phenotypes. So I used the same uh, viral trajectory from the influenza experiment, and they don't produce um, cytokines. But this time, I reproduced the experimental cytokine dosages um, in the three compartments. And I managed to, pro uh, to reproduce the results. For example, IL-12 will give you TH1 and so on. So the rest is the same. I managed to reproduce the other pheno uh, phenotypic responses. And um, for TGF-beta, I also tried something different. I increased the experimental dosage by 10 times, and the response became stronger. So it shows that the model is differentially sensitive to different cytokines. So we are still working on the validation. We have some other studies we are currently doing. So to wrap up, we have built a multi-scale model of CD4 plus T lymphocytes, and we use four different modeling frameworks. And to solve it, we need three numerical methods. So the point is we have proven that multi-scale modeling is a powerful tool in immunology. And the next step is, of course, to apply it to other immune cell types, make them interact. The result will be a virtual immune system, a platform for immunologists. And I'm giving a poster presentation later. So just follow me if you're interested. And thank you. There's time for questions. Yes, please. So you are mixing different biological systems with uh, I guess the different time scales. You mm -hmm. have uh, a concern about how to mix uh, these different uh, models, different time scales together. Yep. Um, so Can there's you a question, please. Okay, um, so he's asking, I have four different types of mathematics, and the models, they are, they are at different time scale, so how do I reconcile the scales? And the answer is, I have a master time scale, and that is an hour, and that is for the agent-based model. And for the ODEs, I'm using the same, the same time scale. And for the logical model, uh, I just assume the steady state. So I'm just using the mo logical model. I solve it to get the steady state, and I use the outputs to parameterize the agent-based model and ODEs at that particular time point, that hour. And the metabolic models, kind of the same, because we know that metabolic modeling is based on steady state assumption. So once again, we just solve, we just optimize the model, we get the production rates of biomass and DNA, and we applied those rates at the agent-based model level for that particular hour, and in the next times that we repeat the process. So there is one master time scale, which is an hour, and for the outputs from the logical and metabolic models, we simply stick to the same set of solutions for that, time, for that hour. Next question by Dr. Kopp. Yeah, I'm curious how you made your metabolic model immune system specific. For example, is the set of active reactions immune cell specific? Or is the biomass equation immune cell specific? Um, so we start our base is a set of models um, um, called Recon 3D or Recon 2. It's published in Nature Biotech. And we use that one to switch on and on genes based on experimental data, genes which are present in different phenotypes. And so that we start with that core with five different metabolic models. Yeah. We have time for more questions. None? Okay, then let us welcome, uh, let us thank our speaker again.
And we can